Welcome to Rodera. Today we are talking with writer and professor Gretchen Bucky uh, and the author of The Grid, The Fraying Wires Between Americans and Our Energy Future. Welcome to Rodera. Thank you. Fascinating book. It's an engineering marvel, something that we take for granted, but we rarely understand, only when it breaks, which doesn't happen that often, but increasingly it's happening more and more. Tell us what The Grid is and why we should care about it. Well, the grid is everything in some ways. Um, it, uh, it's, we tend to think of it as the system of wires, um, just the wires that um, brings electricity into our homes and our, and our businesses. But in fact, the way that the grid works is that um, it's a power plant that makes electricity. It's the wires. And then it's also all the machines that use those wires. Um, and those machines are everywhere in our life, from your cell phone um, in your pocket. It's not plugged in right now, but it is part of the grid because uh, it doesn't work unless you plug it in again. Electric cars are the same thing. They're part of the grid, even though they're driving around. Um, and then there's more basic things like your outlet, your your power strip is a part of the grid, your dishwasher is a part of the grid, um, you know, a printing press is a part of the grid. Essentially, anything that runs on electricity um, in our world uh, is a part of the grid. And then the wires uh, and the towers and the substations and the transformers and the um, generating plants and all of that sort of more technical side. Um, and so I include all of that uh, when I talk about the grid. I mean, really the electrical system. And it's growing. Um, money uh, is now electric. Um, so it's not just it's not just lights. Um, it's not just machinery. It's also information. Our lives in this country and many parts of the world now relies more and more on computers and computers are driven by the fuel, which is electricity. And mm -hmm. we do not think about uh, as Americans, the users of electricity as uh, we think in coal, in terms of coal, oil, solar, wind, but we don't realize we are the consumer of electricity and the electricity runs on the highways and they are called grid. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that so much of the discussion of fuels, it's an important discussion to be having right now with global warming, but it ignores in some ways that we don't, like most people have never touched a lump of coal. Most people have never interacted with oil, maybe with gasoline in their cars, but not with oil coming out of the ground. Natural gas, certainly not. Uh, so there's a way in which the we have one kind of power source that runs our world, which is very intimate. And another sort of set of fuels, which are not intimate at all, which are always at a distance, always part of conversation. Um, and yet we think mostly about those ones. And so with this book, what I wanted to do was just sort of bring that conversation closer to home. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have a very nice historic narrative with some photos as well. And if you could kind of give us a little bit of historic uh, narrative or origins of electricity at the times, since Edison, that how electricity was generated and then distributed. And there were many, many companies and many distribution systems and wires around it at, at that time that sometimes you couldn't even see the skies because there were so many wires. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so now we just have one system and most of the areas in the U.S., this is starting to break down now, but most of the areas in the U.S. have or did historically have and many still have a monopoly utility, which you have to pay your electric bill to. And one of the reasons that we have that system is that before the monopoly utilities, which is to say before about 1920, there was a huge amount of competition in the electricity sector and many, many, many private grids. So grids that did not interlock with each other, um, but for example, ran an apart won a single apartment building. A building in Chicago could have 22 different electrical systems, each with different coal generators in the basement. Transit lines had their own power systems. DC power didn't run very far. So if you had a DC power plant, you know, it would go about a mile and then you had to build another DC power plant. So all of these things had dedicated systems of wires and those wires in urban environments became very dense in the sky. And the, the other thing is that there was also a telegraph system at that time and some beginnings of telephone wires. So all of those wires were in the sky too. And then when companies would go out of business, they would just leave their wires up. And so it was, it was a giant mess. Um, and the what happened um, 
and nobody could make any money. That was also sort of a problem at the time. So things were not interoperable. Systems didn't necessarily work together. They ran different voltages. When alternating current became sort of more the norm in the 1890s, there were many different frequencies of, of oscillation. Um, and so those systems weren't even interoperable with one another. And so if you made a machine and you wanted to sell it to people, you couldn't necessarily sell it to very many people because it had to work with one particular set of parameters for one particular system. And so by the late 1800s, at the end of the 1890s, everybody started to get sick of this. And so the first historical chapter of the book is all about that messy period um, when there were what is called private plants, um, which are private electricity systems the size of a, of a house or a building. And I emphasize that because it's, a, it's something that we're going back to now in the present. And also when there was this sort of giant chaotic jumble of inventions. It was a very exciting time. And the second historical chapter of the book is how all of that mess and all of that excitement was resolved into the relatively boring uh, utility business that we had for most of the 20th century um, with these natural monopolies, um, with eventually universal electrification. And then the third historical chapter is about how that monopoly system began to fall apart um, after the the great energy sort of crises of the 1970s. And that takes us all the way up through Enron um, to about the year 2000. So there's these three, there's a technological historical chapter in the book, there's a business history chapter in the book, and then there's a sort of legislative history chapter in the book. That makes it seem very dull, but actually all of those stories are full of sort of strange people with strange ideas, some of which work, some of which don't, um, many of which were entirely corrupt all the way down and yet nevertheless helped build out the, the sort of little pockets of power and light to uh, a universal system. Very well said. In, in most of the discussion that we hear about the grid is only when we think about the cyber attack or potential cyber attack, but we know the squirrels and foliages are far bit more destructive and the tree cuttings are far more destructive to the grid than the cyber for so far. So far, I mean, it's definitely true that there are a lot of trees in the United States and it's really, really, really hard <laughs> and very expensive to keep them trimmed around power lines. As I say this, I look out into my backyard and there's a power line that runs through three separate trees and then connects into my house. So um, even we are, we don't have a ladder tall enough to do it and the city doesn't bother to do it. So whenever there's a storm, those uh, it's a quite a low voltage wire. It's the one coming into the house, but whenever there's a storm, those tree branches, they whip around um, and they pull on that wire and one day it's going to come down. And with the higher voltage, with higher voltage wires, you can't even let a tree come into contact, mid voltage and higher voltage wires. Um, you can't even let a tree come into contact or even be within a couple of inches of one of those wires because they carry so much electricity, to say it in a non-technical way, that the electricity can actually essentially jump out of the wire. It's traveling and sort of a halo around this wire. It's not necessarily inside the wire. It's not like water in a water pipe. It's sort of it's traveling kind of as a halo around the wire. And so when when there's too much electricity or if the wires are sagging down because it's a hot day, um, which is just what metals do when it's hot, um, they expand, that it can either come in contact with a tree and that will short out the wire or the electricity can actually go wild and arc and it will sort of jump out as lightning and hit a tree which is too close by. That's that's not very good for the wire either. So trees are, you know, they're always growing. It's a thankless task to always be cutting them back. We can manage trees. If we threw sort of an infinite amount of money uh, at them, we would be able to manage them and kudzu and other things of that sort. The squirrels we cannot manage. Um, so squirrels are causing outages in the United States all the time. And that's just other sorts of wildlife also will cause wires to short out. And that's just something that short of killing all the squirrels, we're going to have to deal with. With. And it's funny because when we talk about terrorism, hacking really has become uh, an increasingly important sort of thing that needs to be managed in a relationship with the electricity system as it becomes more and more digital. So I'm sure many people have heard of the smart grid. Uh, much of what that means is there's just a lot more information traveling on electricity wires and there's a lot more, everything is more digital. So if you have a digital smart meter, the information from that meter is being sent wirelessly to a pole and that is being sent either via the wires or wirelessly to somebody who can pick up the information and be, have a, a better sense of what, uh, how much your electricity your house is using and when, 
And that all becomes hackable. Um, but in a way, dealing with terrorists is a lot like dealing with squirrels, which is that you can't actually get rid of them all. So you have to think about how you design a system that leaves the, you know, kind of lets the terrorists continue to do their thing, lets the hackers continue to do their thing, but they never get in. Right. They never actually bring anything down. And there are hacking attempts on the grid every single day in the U.S. at this point. When I was finishing the book, that was not so much true. It's definitely true today. Just like there are squirrels chewing on the wires, sitting on transformers, um, just hanging out. It's warm, you know, as it starts to get colder on using the wires as, as, as highway systems. You see them running around all over the place, the squirrels, and they're shorting things out, too. And so you just have to des try to design around them. In some ways, you were attracted to the grid uh, because of some experience, and uh, you kind of uh, were very curious that, is it another failing system? Uh, tell us about how you got inter interested in, in writing a book on this topic, and why did you come to that conclusion that if it is not broken, if it is not the best, but it is certainly something that is uh, lacking or lagging as well? Yeah, well, the big problem for the grid right now is actually the integration, the mass integration of renewable sources of, of generation. So uh, in the U.S., this means solar and wind power. And I can come back to that. But the, the reason I got interested, in fact, in the grid was watching after fairly significant storms, one in the Pacific Northwest that kind of in the area that I grew up in, that made me understand that people were beginning to lose faith in the system. And we see this today, even in Florida, there are whole pieces of the Florida grid that's going to, that are, will need to be rebuilt essentially from scratch after this most recent hurricane. And so people were starting to have conversations with each other, not radical people, not people who wanted to get off the grid. They were starting to have conversations with each other about how to have heat and light and power when the grid wasn't working. And so reliability and over and over and over in researching the book, reliability was uh, one of the most significant issues that was causing, causing grassroots changes. And again, by grassroots, I don't mean, you know, aging hippies necessarily, just people who are tired of having their power off all the time uh, and are trying to figure out ways to work around it. So that's, that's what got me interested in the project was this kind of loss of faith. I tend to say I was just talking to some to some people in Ireland and they said, it's not a loss of faith, it's a loss of trust. And so I'm still thinking about that. But either way, trust or faith, the electricity system that it was provided by the utility and which people often think of not as being a utility project, a business project, but actually being a service of government, they, they kind of just turned, they were like, okay, that's great when it works, but what else can we do? What can we do on our own? We saw this after Sandy as well, Superstorm Sandy in, in New York, the same set of things happened after the earthquake that happened, I think in the late 1990s in the San Francisco Bay area, the same set of things happened. So there's this kind of moving away from expectation that the system will work that then creates all kinds of intervention in the system. And so this attitude changed at about the same time that the utility monopoly was being broken down. And at about the same time that renewables began to enter into the electricity system really in vaster and vaster numbers. Um, and so all three of these things became tracks that I was following through the contemporary moment. The history is there to sort of allow the reader to understand how we got the system, which is now being restructured, uh, reimagined, rebuilt. And so it, it was failing. It was old. It needed work, but more than that, what needed to happen was a reconceptualization. And that is very much underway now. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of give a quick uh, background to readers, uh, listeners, we have roughly about 20,000 power stations kind of uh, spread over the country. And, and, it trans and we have 160,000 miles of electric wires that transport high voltage electric power. And people may not realize that, that, that this is on top of that now, we have renewals and renewable energy and alternative energy is creating quite a bit of havoc on this uh, grid. I don't want to steal your thunder, but would you give us uh, how renewable energy has become a challenge and a problem in managing the grid and which is really the, at the heart of the blackouts? <laughs> 
Yeah, so the, the in two different ways. One is sort of best exemplified by wind and the other is best exemplified by solar. Um, the, the way that power was made from the very beginning with the idea was that you would have, you would make electricity and then you would distribute it. You would make it somewhere. Someone would make it somewhere. And then it would be distributed to a, a, a wide number of users. And how wide that number of users was, was smaller in the 1880s than it was in the 1910s, than it was in the 1920s, than it was in the 1940s. Um, and I deliberately skip the, the Depression, the Great Depression, because many rules were reversed uh, during that period of time. But the, the, uh, the general idea was somebody is making power, somebody has control over the making of power. They then transit that power to somebody, to places where people will use it, and they sell it to this variety of users. Uh, and the users pay a bill, and then that helps pay for the system. As power plants got bigger, uh, they were always very dirty. Coal, burning coal for electricity is a very, very dirty project. Uh, they especially those kinds of plants, they moved outside of urban areas. We were able to transport transport electricity very far, further and further and further with alternating current. And so we didn't need a power plant right in the middle of where we lived. And my grandmother, she talks about uh, living in Chicago when she was a child in the 1920s and that she would you could actually just wipe before dinner, you would just wipe all the coal dust up off the table. So one of the reasons that instead of having those plants right downtown was just for the, the sheer amount of pollution that they produced. They still produced it, but they didn't produce it where we lived. So that's called the central station model of electricity generation, that like having a big power plant and then a bunch of customers that are somewhere else. And wind power still does that. It still tends to be, you tend, in the United States, you tend to have big wind farms that are far away from where people are living and they're managed by one particular company. But solar power does not. There are big solar plants, but by and large, solar power is something that people are putting up on their rooftops and they're selling the very much smaller amount of electricity that they produce back to the utility who's managing this whole system. So the power is being produced where people live and it's being produced in very small amounts. So you have a power plant on aggregate in some place like Phoenix, but it's not a power plant that works in the same way that a big power plant outside of town works. And the, the market of that is very strange because the utility actually buys at uh, your solar power at the retail rate. So you sell it at the retail rate, but then they have to resell it to someone else at the retail rate. So it's very difficult for them to make a profit um, given the current system. So they have this shattered power plant. They have electricity moving in two directions on the distribution system, which is the local system of wires in, in where people live. Whereas before it only electricity only moved from the power plant into your house. Now it moves out of your house and into the system and into other people's houses. So that's one problem with renewables. And if we move towards small wind, which it seems like we're not doing in the US, but it is happening in places in Europe for sure that people will just, a farm will just put up one wind turbine. Even if it's a big one, there'll just be one. That will start to become an issue also about where this electricity is being made, how much, when it's being made, nobody knows, and how the system then can deal with this new source of electricity. The other problem, and, and it's just as big of a problem for managing the grid and keeping uh, the grid working in good working shape, is variability. So when, the, when you have a coal-fired power plant, it's some manager somewhere who says, here's how much electricity we're going to make during the day, and here's how much electricity we're going to make at night. People use a lot more electricity during the day. And so you have to make more because the big secret of electricity is that you can't store it. So if you're, if you turn on a light in your house, that electricity is being made somewhere in one of those 20,000 power stations in America at exactly that instant, exactly that instant. There's maybe a minute of, of wiggle room that you have. So what we use uh, we just, it just seems very natural that there always be enough electricity for us no matter what we're doing. But that is, that electricity is being made according to our whimsy. So that used to be managers dealt with us as kind of a set of, of averages and could plan out how much coal to burn or how much water to let through a big hydroelectric turbine in order to deal with the fact that people in America tend to get up at the same time every day and turn on all their stuff. They tend to come home at the same time every day and turn on all their stuff. In the summer, they use a lot of air conditioning. So that means you need to make more electricity. But when you have the wind, the wind blows when the wind wants to blow. 
And to some degree, we can now predict it. When I first started writing the book, that wasn't the predictability of wind wasn't even a big part of what was what was happening. What was happening was that uh, individual businesses, often multinationals, were building wind farms where it was windy, and there might not be high voltage power lines out to those places. Um, there might not be people to use that electricity, um, and then the wind would sort of blow and still and blow and still according to its whimsy. And so then you have whimsy on both sides of the system, which has to be perfectly balanced in order to work. And so that has been the big problem of renewables, and we're working it out. So one of the things about this book is it's not the story of like, here comes the loom, the, the, you know, the looming disaster of when our electric grid actually breaks down for good. It's the story of how it wasn't suited to the present anymore. It wasn't suited to the business models that were governing it. It wasn't suited to the ways in which people wanted their electricity made or where they wanted their electricity made. And so all of those things are now being changed about the electric grid. And a lot of that has to do with the will of individual human beings. A lot of it has to do with inventiveness. A lot of it has to do with regulation. And a lot of it has to do with legislation. So in Florida, for example, where they're now rebuilding their grid, they have almost no solar power because the legislature simply doesn't allow it. The utility is quite strong there. And so even though it's the sunshine state and it has one of the, you know, the most available solar power, there isn't any. And so it's a very clear case of being able to see that this is not just about it sort of exploiting what nature has to offer. It's about the very particularities of the American political, governmental, uh, regulatory, uh, and cultural system within which this particular technology sort of lives and changes for better and for worse. So just to kind of uh, have a quick summary of this thing is that the 20th century grid was designed where the uh, the production of the electric or generation of the electricity was fairly stable and and in uh, and and so was the usage. But now we have a fairly a variable uh, production and also fairly fairly variable usage, and all that has to be changed and adapted to the current needs of the 21st century. Yeah, exactly. And computing can kind of do that. Um, usage was always quite variable. It was it was somewhat predictable, but it was always quite variable. But there were there was ten percent of every utility's uh, resources were set aside for these moments when when usage kind of went out of control. It's called peak power, but it's just sort of these weird moments where like everybody's watching TV at the same time, you know, and suddenly there's all this electricity that's being <laughs> used. Um, in England, they have this problem at the ends of soccer matches. So if a soccer match goes over overtime, those, there's a tiny little break before the, the overtime part begins. And since everybody's watching the same soccer matches, which in the U.S. you have sports is kind of divided by by class, by air, by region, by ethnic group. But in England, they all watch the same match. On, if it's a big one on the same day at the same time. And so they also have electric kettles, which we don't have uh, in, the, in the U.S. And so the, the match will end. It will go into overtime. There's this tiny little pause and everybody gets up and they plug in their electric kettle. And this moment is like the biggest surges of demand on the grid mm. above and beyond anything else that the English utilities are dealing with. And so they have to have all these resources set to the side just in case a soccer match goes long. Wow. And I think as users of electricity, we never think about that. We never think about like, how is it that when everybody plugs in their tea kettle at the same time, the grid doesn't actually crash. But it takes a lot of work, uh, a lot of thought. It takes a lot of money. And it's also, yet yeah, it tends to be when we use the dirtiest power plants mm. because they're the ones who are on reserve for those moments. And you mentioned quite well well in the book is that uh, many times these utility companies have to call up these uh, wind power uh, producers to shut down the production and they actually pay them for that. Yeah, they will pay them for that. But the, the thing that's curious about that is that it shouldn't be that way, right? Because what happens is that people who build solar panels or put solar panels on their roofs or build big solar plants, they aren't the utilities. It used to be that generation, so how, how we made electricity, where we made electricity was owned by the utility company. But during deregulation in the 1980s and early 1990s, the utilities in most places in the U.S. had to divest themselves of their power plants. Mm -hmm. And so power is made by independent companies. And this is part of the reason that it's, things are so exciting in the power generation sector. Like why we get all, like somebody's like, okay, let's buy this coal plant. Nobody even knows what a coal plant is 
is worth anymore right now. So like, do you, should you get paid to take it? Should you pay somebody to take it? Like what is the, what's happening? But if you can get an old coal plant, you can, you can basically retrofit it to burn biomass, which has happened quite uh, in quite a few places in California. Uh, it's arguable whether or not biomass is actually better f- if you're thinking from a climate change point of view. But regardless, you can you can do this, right? And so an independent person can buy a coal plant and can uh, turn it into a biomass plant and sell, you know, sell electricity from that. An independent person, and this is what happened in the 70s, there were all of these tiny little dams in California that people bought and they refurbished and they made tiny little amounts of electricity. An independent person can put solar panels on their roof and make tiny little amounts of electricity. And many of these companies, they do exactly what they should be doing and what the system should be actually set up to deal with, which is that they build wind turbines where it's windy and they put up solar panels where it's sunny. The issue is, is that the grid doesn't necessarily go to those places. And there might be a lot of other kinds of generation that are also in the same place. So it's windy, for example, in the Columbia River Gorge. It's also where all of the hydroelectricity from that region already is. And so there's a lot of competition for the existing wire. So if there's too much wind, indeed, the utility will call up the wind farm, which is now a private company, and say, could you please turn your turbines off? And the company can say no. Hmm. They should, they're producing electricity at the time when it's windy. So the system, in a way, is what's standing between, and this is why it's called the fraying wires between Americans and our energy future, because it's the grid and its current organization, as well as its current technology, though that is shifting, that is not, that is making it difficult to integrate renewables in the way that it sort of makes some kind of logical business sense, which is you put a wind turbine where it's windy and you sell that wind power. You don't curtail how much power the wind can make. You figure out how to sell that power. Since we can't store it, and because too much is just as bad as too little, this becomes a very, very, very complicated problem. Yeah, in the last century, we have traveled very far, just after the Depression era, era when we had a, a reorientation and a restructuring of the electric industry, and then slowly moving from there into the after the World War, uh, we had a massive surge in the appliance, and that kind of guaranteed a rise in demand for utility companies. And for now, them for for them now to think that the demand will not grow is totally unthinkable. Yeah, well, actually, so they're the ones who sold us all that stuff, the utility companies. <laughs> <laughs> GE was an electric company. And and one of the reasons is it's quite hard to turn up a fossil fuel power plant. It's hard to turn it up and down. So what they really wanted were things that uh, Americans would be using, lots of Americans would be using, that use as much electricity as ni- at night as it did during the day. Um, and this is why we have electric refrigerators. Um, Gas refrigerators were a completely viable technology, but GE in the 1940s, uh, late 1940s, early 1950s, and other other utility companies realized that what they really needed was for Americans to have electric refrigeration. Uh, So now we do. And many, uh, much of the growth of appliances was that you would get a deal on your electric bill if you put in an electric stove, for example, that you also were buying from the electric company. So this was orchestrated as a part of the business of electricity. It's it was also uplift, you know. It's not that like, oh, we shouldn't have refrigerators because that was a, a fast one the electric company pulled on us. It's great to have refrigerators. It's great to have electric stoves. Gas stoves are arguably better, but you know, electric stoves are good. In Quebec, we have all electric heating. In the Pacific Northwest, they have electric heating. That's probably better than oil at this particular moment in time if that electricity is made renewably. So it's not it's not a case of simple good and bad, but that 20th century is deeply intertwined with the electric business, which was the appliance business. And now electricity use in the U.S. has been flat since 2007. And what we think is that, in fact, it will begin to decline if only subtle despite the fact that we have way more server farms going in, we have way more personal electronics, we have way more people. And that's because the efficiency of these machines is getting so much better. Exactly. And that leads to the other question, which is a very important one, is that we all have little storages of electricity in our batteries, but at the grid level, the storage is the issue. I mean, uh, what the problem today is that the grid is is the weakest link. And if you want to go a little bit on detail, that how critical the storage is at the grid level and how what are we doing about uh, that storage problem yeah so the at, at 
grid level, most of the storage that we have is uh, pumped hydro, which means um, when there's extra electricity, we use it to pump water up a hill and put it in a reservoir. And then when there's not enough electricity, essentially the gates are opened and that water flows back down the hill and uses gravity to regenerate an electric current. That's most of what we have in the US. There are sort of battery dreams and there are some larger scale batteries that have gone on, especially most recently in California. Fairbanks, Alaska has a fairly big battery that can power the town, I think for seven minutes, but it can power half the town for 15 minutes, which is what they normally do. And it's basically just a way to keep the, the hospital and the lights and everything on while they switch over to diesel. So this is what, when people talk about storage, like it's true that we have these batteries in our phones, we have batteries everywhere, but that leads us to believe that there is this grid scale battery storage. What then begins to happen is many things. One is a solid subset of people who are saying we need, we need storage at grid scale. Like this is an absolute necessity to reform our grid. It's probably not an absolute necessity. We ran a very complicated electric grid for a century without computers and without storage. Um, So now computers will be a necessary part of things. Storage, however, is something that we can get around in a couple of different ways. I'm not saying we shouldn't have it, but it's sort of wrong to think that it's the only way to the future of of a grid with a lot of renewables integrated into it. One way is to have a lot of microgrids, which is to say much, much smaller grids that have smaller levels of storage in them. So this is what Tesla is trying to sell are these battery packs that you can put in your basement. Green Mountain Power in Vermont, they actually will, I think you pay $40 a month for one of these battery packs in your house and you can use it, but they can also use it. So it's essentially distributed storage. So instead of building a giant battery, there are batteries, but they're, they're quite small, but there's a lot of them. It sounds a lot like solar power. There is generation, but it's quite small and there's a lot of it and it's scattered all over the place. Um, So that's one way for batteries to be operationalized without having a giant battery somewhere. Another thing that's happening, uh, and you see this in the American West, and you also see it quite often in Europe, is balancing electricity generation with electricity use by having a grid which has different resources available at different times. So you might have a lot of sun in Phoenix, but not very much sun in Provo. And so the grid is integrated in such a way that the Phoenix, the electricity being made in Phoenix is moved to Provo. And then when there's wind later on coming out of near Los Angeles, but the sun is setting, then that wind comes in and is used to provide the electricity to Phoenix. Um, and it's going to essentially have a, a very large regional market. So there's, you can have tiny grids that, in, that interact with each other that are interoperable. You can have a giant grid that sort of works, uh, various pieces of it work in concert with each other. Um, these are sort of two straightforward ways to deal with not having grid scale storage. The third way people are are really on the fence about, which is that we can actually control people's use. So the U.S. grid was designed so that we could use as much electricity as we want whenever we want it. Avarice, you know, crazy ideas. You can run an electric kiln in your house if you want and just turn it on whenever you feel like it. And the system is built to make sure that that electricity is available to you. What people are talking about is putting some sort of price system in and definitely smarter electronics so that you would know or your phone would know or your electronics would know that right now, electricity is quite expensive. And then your dishwasher can say, right now, I don't actually want it. I'm not going to turn on right now. I will turn on when the electricity price is lower. And that's a way of balancing production with consumption by actually managing consumption. And it feels very awkward to people. People tend not to like it, but it's one way of, of, there's a lot of talk right now about figuring out how to use the customer side of things a little bit more than we ever have in the past. Essentially, in the British case, what you would say is, if you want to boil your tea kettle right now, it's going to be insanely expensive. <laughs> so maybe people won't, wouldn't boil their tea kettle right then. Yes. Yeah. Then you can shift the demand to a different curve and that will help. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, fascinating story. It's not just about the, uh, the wires and towers. It's a social, cultural, and it's a technical challenge that we're all facing in, in order to improve or bring our grid uh, to the 21st century.
Yeah, absolutely. And I think by 21st century, what a lot of people mean right now is trying to figure out how to decarbonize the electricity supply. And right. And, and that's where the issue is, that it is not just a generation, but what happens after generation, after the generation is more fascinating and more critical. Yeah, oh, as fascinating and as critical, I would say. Um, and, you know, there's the I think it's both France and England and now China are moving to ban the um, internal combustion engine so that cars will not run on gasoline anymore. I think one is 2025, one is 2030. I don't know what the Chinese are saying, but they're sort of pointing in that direction as well. And so that become that means that those cars will very likely run on electricity. So that is a whole nother way of thinking about how we bring the electricity system into the 21st first century because we're going to, all of those cars are going to begin to be plugged in, you know, if they even are cars, if they even work like cars anymore, that's also the question of what will, what will become as decarbonization moves across sectors. But no matter what, I can say that electricity is going to become more and more fundamental uh, as that shift happens. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you and uh, I hope you have a, a follow up in a few years if there is more development on the book. Well, there's plenty to say. There's always plenty to say. In some ways, the book is already uh, ever so slightly out of date. Um, I, I urge people to read it in order to understand what's happening today, uh, right now, because things are moving so quickly in terms of reforming the electricity system that it, it's flabbergasting, especially given how things were when I began the book, which was this very, very slow sort of dawning awareness that maybe we could we could do things differently. Thank you very much.